I said, Amen. Amen. Let's rise up and pray together. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study. We bless your name for your people here today. We pray that the Holy Ghost will come upon everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Revive everyone. Amen. Revive the leaders. Amen. Revive the workers. Amen. Revive the members. Amen. Revive your church today, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking, O oh Lord, that the study of your word will bring light to everyone today. And we pray that these words will not just be on the pages of scripture, they will be in our heart. Saturate our lives so that, Lord, this day will do your work to rescue the perishing with the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. I want to just uh, recall so that you remember what the Lord had said. The Lord had said that he was going to send the Holy Ghost upon the disciples. And they were waiting for the power of the Holy Ghost. In the passage we are looking at today, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. You'll see in verse 33 that something had happened already. It says, therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father, the power, the promise of the Holy Ghost. He has sent forth this which he now see and hear. That is, the Lord Jesus Christ had gone to heaven. And because he was now in the right hand, the right hand of the Father, he now sent the Holy Ghost. That's why the church is praying today. Come, Holy Ghost, dark is the hour. We need your power, we need your strength so that we'll do what the Lord has sent us to do. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. I want to remind you that in this Acts chapter 2 verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. It was only after that time the Holy Ghost was sent unto them. We need to re-emphasize that because many people today, they're asking for the power of the Holy Ghost. They're asking for the strength of the Holy Ghost. They're asking for the illumination, inspiration of the Holy Ghost. But they do not understand when, how the Holy Ghost actually comes. Let me turn the Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading there from verse 30. So you will find the reason, you know the reason why many people seeking the Holy Ghost, asking for the Holy Ghost and praying, come Holy Ghost, why that Holy Ghost does not come. In his strength, in his power, in his light, in his conviction, in his courage, so that he'll make us fruitful in the ministry of the work of the Lord today. Look at this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby he is sealed unto the day of redemption. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Instead, you know, say there's something that grieves the Holy Spirit in the life of anyone, in the life of a child of God, in the life of a member of the church, in the life of a family, husband and wife, parents and children, something that the Holy Ghost is grieved. When, as a person, as an individual, your heart is full of bitterness or wrath or anger or clamor or evil speaking or malice, or in the family, husband and wife, parents and children, or maybe in the church of the living God, the pastor and the members of the church, and the workers and the leaders, when we have bitterness and when we have wrath and we're full of anger and clamor and evil speaking, division, disunity among us, and then we're praying that the Holy Ghost will come. And we're wondering, why don't we see the power of the Holy Ghost, the strength of the Holy Ghost, the supernatural, as the church, as the early church saw, because you see, the early church, they were of a frame of mind. They had an experience that is called sanctification. And all these things that were already about here, all those things were cleared up. And then the Holy Ghost came upon them. When we cleanse ourselves and through the blood of the Lamb, we're cleansed and we're made free. And all these things are no more there. The Holy Ghost is coming. I said, He's coming. Look at verse 32 and it says, And be ye kind one to another. 
tender hearted and he says forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you let's come back here to Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 verse 1 it says when the day of Pentecost was fully come when that day was fully come no disunity among them and there was no disagreement among them, no discord among them. Every one of them were kind one to another. They were tender hearted. They had forgiven each other. And because of that unity, the same heart and the same desires and the same goal and the same decision, and they were all praying together. That's why it says, when that day came, the day of Pentecost was fully come, all with one accord in one place. See what that does. When we are all of one accord. I'm looking at Genesis chapter 11. And we're looking at verse 6 over here. Genesis chapter 11. And we're looking at verse 6. The Lord had given them the great commission. If they were going to do that successfully. And if they were going to do it without any possibility of Satan stopping them. Hindering them. Limiting them. That unity was very important. We've been talking about done since 2012, since last year. That is discipling a whole nation. And if we're going to do that, rescue the perishing, we need the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. You'll find in the passage we're studying today, Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost and all those 11 other apostles and all the disciples of the Lord. And he stood as one man, united together. And then Peter opened his mouth and he preached the word. And 3,000 became born again, converted just with one message because they started with unity and then the feeling of the Holy Ghost empowerment by the Holy Ghost. Look at this Genesis chapter 11. I'm looking at verse 6. It says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. Look at the language. Instead of saying the people are one. They became so united, they became as one man. And so the scripture says, the people is one. And they have all one language. One language, the language of this is what we're going to do. The same language they had, the same mind they had. And it says this that they begin, they begin to do, and nothing will be a kind of restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Because of that unity, it says nothing will be restrained from them. Nothing will be withheld from them. That should suit then when we're all united, every prayer will be answered. Every yoke will be broken. All the possibilities will become possible. All mountains will move away because with one mind and one faith and one focus and holding on to the promise of God, because of that unity, great things will happen. Above that, beyond that, on top of that, the Holy Ghost will come. And then when the Holy Ghost comes, it will come in His great power. I need to emphasize this point because... That is what is reading many people. I found people that have prayed and prayed and prayed, Holy Ghost come, and they've not seen anything. And then I found the people that have separated themselves and set time apart, and they say, I just want this power of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost has not come, and they're saying, why? Why? I've fasted, I've prayed, I've consecrated. I believe I'm sanctified to you. And yet the Holy Ghost has not come. And they know that God wants them to do exploits for the Lord in this hour and this time. And because of that, they know they cannot do this in human energy. That's why they are seeking for the power of the Holy Ghost. And yet, after that time, after all the time of seeking and praying and searching, the Holy Ghost has not come. Perhaps you need to look at the area of unity with the body of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all ye all ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. They were all together with one heart with one mind. They were saying the same thing. They were facing the same direction. They desired the same thing. There was no division in their midst in doctrine. There was no division in their mind, in their, in their midst in ministry. There was no division, no disunity among them in decisions the church was making. Everything the leadership said, yes, 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 they agreed. And because of that unity and agreement, the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost. The Lord will unite us together. 
one heart and one mind and one goal and one direction, one decision that we all take and we're thinking the same way. Look at this in Romans chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 15, we're looking at verse 6, says that ye may with one mind and one mouth, one mind and one mouth, is telling us it's not just an external union, that is outwardly with one mouth. Yes, I agree, I agree, I know what I'm going to do in my mind. Yes, of course, I do agree, but then I have a different kind of concept in mind with one mind, and then with one mouth, it says in that verse, says, glorify God. Even the, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When our unity is like that, one mind and one mouth, and we're all together, and if anything wants to come in between us to break us, we we'll say, no, it cannot happen, it will not happen. We endeavor to do that, and we make effort to do that. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 3. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. It says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That is, I just want to be at peace with my brothers, with my sisters. I want to be at peace with the leadership in the church. And because of that, I will endeavor, I will labor, I will try my best. I will, I will crucify self. I will not allow self to rise up with his ugly head in my heart, in my mind, to say, I'm opposed to that. I don't agree with that. No, I'm not going to accept that. You see, the Holy Ghost will not work in your life. With that kind of attitude of disagreement and, dis and the disloyalty, he's saying over here, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bunch of peace. I pray to happen among us. Actually, they had that unity because Jesus had prayed for them, and the prayer of Jesus was answered on their behalf. I pray that the prayer of Jesus will be answered in your heart, in your life, in your family, with all our workers, with all our members in the whole church in Jesus' name. What prayer did he pray for them that brought them together so closely together, knitted together? They were all united. Look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 9. It says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. He prayed a special prayer for the people of God. He prayed a special prayer for the disciples. And you are included if you are not of the world, if you are of Christ, if you are born again, if your sins have been taken away, if you can say, I am of Christ and he is mine. He says, I'm praying for them i pray not for the world look at this in verse 9 it says but i pray for them which thou art given me for they are thine what prayer did he pray for them jump down to verse 14 i have given them thy word and the world has hated them these are the people who are born again. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. You can tell them they were born again. Some people say that nobody was born again until Christ went to the cross, until Christ died, until Christ rose again. How about these people? How about these people? They were born again because how could Jesus say they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world, if they were not born again? Look at verse 15. I pray, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. He'll keep you from the evil. Then Jesus said once again, they are not of the world, even as, think about that, even as, think about that, even as, you know, you could just have said they are not of the world, and then full stop, but he said, the, the, the measure of they are not being of the world, and the level of they are not being, the height of they are not being the world is just like I am not of the world, they are not of the world. The things they will not put on, they will not put on. And the things they will not drink, they will not drink. And the things they will not smoke, they will not smoke. And the places they will not go, they will not go. And the kind of agreement, attachment, interaction, they will not, they will not have with the world, they will not have. And the kind of politics they will not be involved with, they will not be involved with. Because he said they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. And then he said, said 9, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It will sanctify us. And when he sanctifies us, that's when this unity will come. Look at verse 21, that they all may be one. Sanctify them, that they all may be one. Sanctify them, that they may be united. Sanctify them, that they may be of one mind of one and one mouth. Sanctify them, that they may have the same judgment and the same attitude and the same disposition. Sanctify them, that they all may be one, as thou Father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe. 
that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Do you see the importance of, uh, of being together, of, unite, of unity together, that the world may believe? And let's think about this now. Let's say we're 1,000 believers, and then out there we have 100,000 sinners, because the church is still smaller than the world. Look at your district, look at your city, look at where you came from, and look at all the believers there. If you collect all the believers, real believers there, the sinners outside, they are much more, they are more, they are more than the people in the church. And it says, if these 1,000 believers are united, it will help, the Holy Ghost will impart them, and adjust them, indwell them, then I'll be able to send them to the world, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And even sometimes, you know, people, they're so selfish, they don't understand. They only think about themselves, you know, so and so said this, and so and so did this, because of that, there's unity, and we're solving problems, and solving problems, husband and wife, they cannot be united, they sit down together, and the pastor, instead of evangelizing, instead of planning how to evangelize the rest of the world, he said, forgive her now, forgive him, no, we're going to separate, no, we're going to divorce, why don't you look at the Bible, no, no Bible this time, because what this fellow has done, when we're not united like that, number one, we waste our time. But then, number two, we waste the ministry of the pastor, of the leadership there, because he's told them solving problems, solving problems. Not only that, the Holy Ghost will not indwell us, energize us, empower us, and feel us so that we can go and reach out to the world. That's why Jesus said, I'm praying for them. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, that they all may be one, that the world may believe that thou hast said, me look at verse 22 and the glory which thou gavest me i have given them when we're not united the glory that you should give unto us as a judge it will not give unto us then it says that they may be one even as we are one and then it says i in them and thou in me that that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast loved them uh, even as thou hast loved me they may know that you have sent me and you have loved them as you have loved me and this is what the lord is telling us and that's the reason why acts of the apostles chapter 2 verse 1 it says and when the day of pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and then it says suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and then it says and it filled all the house where they were sitting and it says there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as of fire and then it sat upon each of them and they were all and they were all how many of them tell me out loud and they were all filled they were all filled i pray that they will come again i said that they will come again that you there and himself there and herself there and everyone everywhere that we come together our hearts all united we're seeking the same thing we're passionate for the same thing and we want to reach the world and we want to touch the lives of other people and because of that unity while we're all sitting together standing together praying together while we're fellowshipping together then suddenly that holy ghost will come that power will come, that anointing will come, and then it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. It was then, that was the thing that brought all the people, they came all together, and the Lord drew all those people because of the noise, because of the fire, because of the wind, and because of the experience that they saw and heard. And then when they came together, God energized Peter the Apostle. And then he rose up, he began to talk to them. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. He began to preach. This was the very first thing he did after the Holy Ghost came upon him. You see, there are many churches that are called Pentecostal churches. Have you heard that before? I said, have you heard before? What, who are the Pentecostal churches? And the Pentecostal churches, they think that the churches that speak in tongues, that's all they know. They think that, you know, when the Holy Ghost comes, you speak in tongues in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. When the Holy Ghost comes, Monday, Bible study, you speak in tongues, Thursday, speak in tongues, Sunday, speak in tongues. And when the Holy Ghost has come in the conference, I think, speak in tongues, speak in tongues. When the Holy Ghost comes, choir wants to sing, speak in tongues first, and then you sing in the choir. And then when you are excited about something, you check up, 
up and then speak in tongues, speak in tongues. We are Pentecostal. Hey, that is not it. Because you see, when the Holy Ghost came upon them, the very thing Jesus Christ has told them that when the Holy Ghost comes, you will become witnesses unto me. It says, but it shall receive power. That's the real essence and the purpose and the reason, the main reason for having the Holy Ghost. It shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon me and ye shall be witnesses. Instead of speaking in tongues, morning, afternoon, evening, witnessing, morning, evening, morning, afternoon, and evening. Instead of speaking in tongues, you know, retreat and everyone is witnessing every time, retreat time and conference time and congress time and monday bible study and the thursday revival and the workers meeting witnesses were witnessing for the lord jesus christ this is what he said he said that when that holy ghost has come you'll have the power you'll witness unto me then in jerusalem and judea and samaria and to the utmost part of the earth there will be home missions work. You'll be fulfilling the great commission in Jerusalem where you live, in Lagos where you live, in that other city where you live, and then in Judea, that's missions already. In Samaria, that's missions already within your country, but now you go beyond your country to the uttermost part of the earth. Show me a church that says we're Pentecostal, we have the Holy Ghost and all, and they never have any desire, any dream, any drive within them to go beyond to Jerusalem, to go to Judea, to go to Samaria, and you are making announcement, and you are telling the need is there, that, that country needs a missionary, that province needs a missionary, that place, and they say they are filled with the Holy Ghost, talking in tongues, talking in tongues, and you cannot find anybody that will be witnesses in Judea and Samaria, to the utmost part of the earth, and then it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they speak the word of God with boldness. When the Holy Ghost comes, supernatural boldness will come upon your life and then the desire to not just stay there not just sit down there you will want to go and do something in the, in the regions beyond i pray that this real holy ghost power will come in our lives and empower us in jesus name you see those apostles and disciples of christ about 120 in number they had just received the outpouring of the spirit of god the pentecostal power the pentecostal baptism and then immediately the active ministry of the holy ghost that was preaching came upon them the spirit empowered them energized them and boldly and courageously they proclaimed the message of salvation to the world around them with the irresistible power of the of the spirit of god the sinners hearts were touched and prayed and pierced with the message and conviction came upon them and they were all made willing to repent and they believed and submitted themselves surrendered to the lord jesus christ Receive him as Savior and as Lord. And that is what we want to see today. It will happen again. I said it will happen again. Before we can disciple a whole nation, before dawn can become possible, we must have this power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. And then, you know, we'll not be pulling you and dragging you and drawing you and pleading with you and, and begging and beseeching. When are you going to rise? Or when are you going to work for the Lord? You've been in the church for 10 years. You are not a worker. You've been in the church for 20 years. You are not a worker. What a good to do evangelism. You don't know how to open your mouth because the Holy Ghost has not come, but the Holy Ghost is coming. I said the Holy Ghost is coming and when that Holy Ghost comes upon your life and it takes over your life he possesses you, he indwells you, he saturates you, he energizes you, you will never be the same again in Jesus name he comes to fill us up he comes to indwell us, he comes to comfort us, he comes to empower us, he comes to teach us and to guide us, he comes to envision us you cannot have the Holy Ghost and just and remain visionless. You'll, be, you'll become visionary. You'll see the vision of the people who are perishing. And then you'll equip us and enable us to go and preach and pray and prevail on men. Moving us along with a, like a mighty wind in a stable proclamation of the gospel. I pray that you'll become so zealous, you'll become unstoppable in Jesus' name. And let's look at the passage you are looking at today. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14 to verse 21, which is point 1, prophetic perspective, prophetic perspective on the Pentecostal baptism. You see, Peter, when all these people came together, some of them, of course, they were ignorant. The world can see anything. Oh, some said they are drunk. 
That's why they're speaking the way they're speaking. And other people say, this cannot, this cannot be drunkenness because they're speaking real language. We're hearing them magnifying the Lord and speaking of the wonderful works of God. And they speak in our language. And so that's why Peter rose up. But I want you to notice something here. Peter did not know that such a crowd was going to gather. Peter did not know that there were thousands and thousands of before him. Peter did not have an outline in his hand. Peter did not read the book of Joel before he came, before that time. All of a sudden, because the Holy Ghost came, he is the author of scripture. And because the author of the Bible is living inside you, is living inside the man. When you open his mouth like this, scriptures came out. The Holy Ghost will come unto you. The Holy Ghost will fill you up. He is the author and the writer of the Bible. He knows everything. There is nothing in the Bible the Holy Ghost does not know. And when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, the illumination of the Holy Ghost, and the revelation of the Holy Ghost, the interpretation from the Holy Ghost will come through you in Jesus' name. Look at this. It says in verse 15, For these are not drunken as she, as she suppose. Seen it is, but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet. See, very clear. This is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my, of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your, and your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall tell me dream dreams. He says that this is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet. You see, when the Holy Ghost comes like that, you'll not say, ah, there's a scripture I could have uh, spoken to these people, I should have quoted to these people that will convince them that this is the infilling, this empowerment, and this is the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But I'm trying to remember, I cannot remember. The Holy Ghost will remind you because he is the author. He knows where that verse is. He knows that that is the appropriate verse at that time and so he brought it to Peter and Peter said this is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet that he will send the Holy Ghost. I want you to notice something here. Many people that just say they are Pentecostals, they are Pentecostals, they don't understand and they don't understand that when the Holy Ghost comes, here is what he does. See what he said that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh and then he says your sons and daughters shall prophesy. They will proclaim. Show me a person that has the Holy Ghost. There's no prophecy. There's no proclamation. There's no declaration of the word of God and uh, thank God I'm saved and sanctified and uh, filled with the story story. That's telling story. Show us the evidence that because the Holy Ghost has come they shall prophesy. You are in the boss, you'll proclaim the word of God. You are at the station, you'll proclaim the word of God. You are in your community, you'll proclaim the word of God because that's what it says. They will proclaim the word of God. That's what it means there. And then he said, he said your son, your, your young man Men shall see shall shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams you know what that means they'll see vision you see the visions of people perishing if you look at the acts of the apostles uh, Paul the apostle in the night he saw a vision and a man said come over to Macedonia and help us he woke up in the morning and then he told all his team members he said I had the voice I had the word in Macedonia that is where the ministry is now come over to Macedonia and help us Show me people that say they have the Holy Ghost. There's no heavenly vision. Paul the Apostle said, Agrippa, I have not been disobeyed to the heavenly vision. The heavenly vision will be there. The Macedonian call will be there. To the call to go and reach that person, reach that person, reach that person. Sometimes the husband says, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Wife says, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Children, they say, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. And then the father sees the vision of the Macedonian call. And the Lord is calling him to go there and do this and do that. And then the wife is saying, My husband, where are you going? The Macedonian call, I saw the vision. Because it says, when we have the Holy Ghost, your sons we will see vision. I've seen the vision, the Lord is calling me. And then the wife was, okay, if you go, you go by yourself. I am not with you. Sister, are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Of course, yes. I'm saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost. But you never see the vision of the people who are perishing. And then the children are crying. Daddy, where are you going? You want to leave us? No, she is not leaving. You follow after both father and mother and children. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, you'll see that vision. 
I said you'll see that vision and you'll go together in Jesus' name. Show me a Pentecostal church. Sometimes it's a church that claims to be Pentecostal, like our church, for example. And here is, uh, you know, the pastor of the church and like me, for example, now the GS. And the Lord, they show me the vision of reaching here and reaching and reaching there. And if I'm going, you cannot be in two places at the same time. If you are in Lagos, then you'll not be in the other place. If you are in the other place, then you'll not be in Lagos. And then if the Lord is showing me the vision of the regions beyond, you need to touch that life, touch that life, and touch that life there. And then I take a few Sundays off and I just go to that place. And then the people have, you know, when I come back, the people are saying, Pastor, where are you, where are you going? What have you been doing? Uh, we didn't have combined service uh, the other Sunday. And then the other Sunday, we need to have a combined service. We want to see you. I say, are you full of the only praise the Lord, Pastor? I remember, can I give you my testimony? Uh, it was at that retreat when, so, you know, the Mesa preached the word of God and the Holy Ghost came upon me like this. And uh, Pastor, can I demonstrate it to you and uh, show you I have the Holy Ghost? I said, okay, no, don't, don't do that now. Uh, but if you have the Holy Ghost, you agree with me. If you have the Holy Ghost, the Lord is giving me the vision to go there, preach the gospel. If you have the Holy Ghost, that same mind will be you say i want to move as my pastor is moving i want to preach as my pastor is preaching he is going there i want to go there and then i go here you go there she goes there he goes there we will evangelize the world in jesus name but you know when uh, you know when we say we claim to have the holy ghost and then the one that has the holy ghost is moving on is driving on is saying this is what i'm going to do and then the other people that say they have the holy ghost they're pulling him down they are, you know, stopping him and they are dragging him, but they say, no, you will not go. No, you will not go. Well, we'll go. Amen. I said, we will go. The Holy Ghost will come upon us in Jesus' name. He will energize us. It will empower us. It will send us forth. And this country of Nigeria, we're going to evangelize every, every corner here in Nigeria. Every local government in Nigeria. Every region in Nigeria. Every state in Nigeria. Everyone from north to south, from east to west. We're going to evangelize in Jesus' name. Because if you really have the Holy Ghost, you'll not be able to raise the vision. The dream will be there. You say, I have a dream. I have a dream. Uh, we're not talking of dreaming that, you know, tomorrow it will rain. I dreamt that, you know, they are going to promote me the place of work and be watching it. At the end of this month, I'm going to receive salary increase. We're not talking of that. We're talking of the vision and the dream of those uh, places beyond. I have a dream that my dream is I want to conquer that land. Give me this mountain because I'm still as strong today as I was 45 years ago because the Lord said at that time, because you have a different spirit and a different mind, and your, your, your feet will step on this land, and I'm going to step on that land. That's the dream we're talking about, and that dream you are going to have in Jesus' name. And if I have the vision, you have the vision, I have the dream, you have the dream, and the brother has, and the sister has, and every member of the family, every member of the church has this vision, has that, this dream, this country of Nigeria will be evangelized. Not only Nigeria, all the continent of Africa. I said all the continent of Africa. In fact, what we are doing now, we're going to be attaching one city to another city. We're going to say, this city here, deeper life in this city, reach out to that city. This region here, reach out. Because when the Holy Ghost is coming, all these studies we're having, it is not in vain. I said it is not in vain. And when that Holy Ghost comes upon every region in our land here, we're going to associate this region with that region and this state with that state capital, with that national capital. And I'm telling you, before long, the whole land will be evangelized. You see, when the Holy Ghost comes, this is what he does. It's not just that, you know, I'm claiming to have an experience, save, sanctify, and fill with the Holy Ghost. Something will happen. It's happening already. Look at verse 18, and it says, And on my servants, and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall do what? Prophesy. You know, there are some people saying, well, maybe it's the mother that will call the children and say, children, face your studies, children, face your work, children, face this. Don't say you are joining campus fellowship. Don't say you are joining workers. Because we've given, you know, our family has already donated our father, our, our, my husband, your father. We've donated him to the ministry. He is already head and shoulders doing the work. 
we now, the rest of us can take our time and do whatever it is. So it's, therefore, don't join daddy. Let daddy do whatever he wants to do. We have released him. We have donated him to Christ and donated him to the ministry. Look at what he says here. You are not donating anybody to He has his life to live. He has his ministry to carry out. And you have your life to live and your ministry to carry out. The man will do it. The woman will do it. The parents will do it. The children will do it. As the father is moving on, he set an example for the wife. And he said, my wife, see what I'm doing as I'm winning these to the Lord. You are also winning those to the Lord. And as the father and the mother, as they have the vision, being full of the Holy Ghost, and they are moving on, they are doing the work. Also the children, they are following the example of their parents and they are moving on we're going to do it together in Jesus name and that's what it says here in verse 19 it says and I will and then it says I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath it says blood and, and fire and uh, and also vapor or smoke this is going now to the time of the great tribulation but then it says the sun shall be turned into darkness you see when the Holy Ghost comes you don't limit the word of God you are saying you speak of today you speak of tomorrow you you speak of peaceful time, you speak of war time, you speak of time of so you speak of a time of reaping. And that's what Peter the Apostle is doing here, is going beyond even that period, that, that, that period of time. And then he goes on, he says before the before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And then he says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, tell me shall be saved. That means that as you go out and I go out, and we're all expecting the coming of the Lord, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, they'll be saved in Jesus' name. And let's see what, uh, what uh, Peter was referring to. That's in Joel chapter 2. This is what Joel had written, and this is what Peter was referring to when he said, uh, this is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet. Look at Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 28, it says, and it shall come to pass as afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, all flesh. If it's upon all flesh, have you taken your portion? You'll have your own portion. And then it says, when I pour my spirit upon all flesh, it says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your, and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions and also upon my servants and upon my handmaids as in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in heaven and then in the earth and blood and fire and vapors of smoke and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come and it shall come to pass it shall come to pass that whosoever 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 in your community whosoever around your house fellowship there, whosoever in your school, whosoever in your college, university there, whosoever of your relatives, whosoever in your village or city or town, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance and, the, and as the Lord has said and in the remnant in whom, whom the Lord shall call. You see that promise has been given before. Look at I Isaiah chapter 44, the promise given by the Lord. This is prophetic perspective of what happened on that day of Pentecost. In, um, in Isaiah chapter 44, I'm reading here from verse 3. It says, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. If you are thirsty tonight, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. And then it says, some flaws upon the dry ground. I will, you know, some people, I feel dry. I feel dry. My prayer life is dry. My fellowship life is dry. When I read the Bible, everything is dry. I try to get involved in the work of God, but I'm dry. I'm dry with it. Even when I speak, the word is dry. It cannot reach anybody or touch anyone. What you need is the Holy Ghost. Who you need is the Holy Ghost. And that Holy Ghost will come tonight. I said it will come tonight, and all that dryness will sweep everything away. It will pour water upon you, and then freshness will come, and life will come, vitality will come unto you, because the Holy Ghost has come. That's why it says, some floods upon the dry ground, and I will pour out my spirit. Or, or, I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thy offspring. When that spirit comes, blessings also will come. I pray that blessing will come. 
Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Here the Lord is telling us the steps it takes uh, when the Holy Ghost comes. That is, number one, he does this. Number two, he does that. Number three, he does that. And then the power of the Holy Ghost begins to work in a mighty way in your life. And this is your day. I said, this is your day. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, then will I sprinkle clean water upon them, and it shall be clean. I said you will be clean. Your conscience will become clean. Your life will become clean. Your language will become clean. Your mind will become clean. Your memory will become clean. Everything as the Lord himself brings salvation. This is salvation here. In verse 25, this is salvation. He'll cleanse you. He'll clean you up. And then you say, for more your field there, for more your idols, will I cleanse you. Look at verse 26. Verse 25, that's salvation. That's salvation. Verse 26, this is sanctification. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. That is sanctification. Now, Holy Ghost baptism. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall, ye shall keep my judgments and do them. You'll be able to do the will of the Lord. That time has come. I said that time has come and you will have the experience in Jesus' name. And that's why Jesus Christ told the apostles and uh, told the disciples to you, Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 4. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, we're looking at it from verse 4. It says, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says, he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. He told them, you must wait. This is an important, uh, is, uh, an important experience and is coming upon you. You must wait, you must pray, you must seek the face of the Lord. Then he told them, the reason why, but ye shall receive power in verse 8. When the Holy Ghost, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses of him, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and to the earth and Samaria and to the thermos part of the earth. You see Peter, who had denied the the Lord just uh, less than 50 days earlier and he had cursed. Now today because the Holy Ghost came upon him, all the weakness is gone. All your weakness will go. All the fear of man was gone. The fear of man will get away from your life in Jesus' name. The timidity and you know the inward looking, the introverted kind of personality, all that went away. And the guilt where I denied the Lord, how can I talk now? And already I said I didn't know him. How can I be telling people now that this is Christ? He is risen indeed. And God has set him up to be our savior. Then all that timidity was gone. And so he boldly bore witness to the death and resurrection and exaltation of Christ. No longer fearful, no longer timid, no longer vacillating between two opinions. He preached to the multitude of religious Jews with conviction, vigor, courage, and compassion. The Lord had promised to give him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And now he has got the key. And because he got the key, he was able to open the door of faith unto the multitudes. As thousands of Jewish people gathered wondering about the sight they saw and the sound they heard. He then arose and he gave them the true scriptural explanation. And he said, this is that which the Holy Ghost had already said will happen from Joel. And then he, he had revelation. Can you see that? He had inspiration. Can you see that? He had interpretation, proper interpretation and application of the word of God. Here was power demonstrated. Here was courage revealed. Here was wisdom manifested. Said, here was zeal that was visible and single mindedness. And Peter spontaneously quoted from Joel and the Psalms, and he gave interpretation as a place to Christ and then applied the word of God, persuasive, penetrating impact. And let's see the next point powerful preaching with Pentecostal baptism. Powerful preaching, powerful preaching. As it happened to Peter, it will happen to you. I said it will happen to you. You are weak before, you are going to be strong. You are blind, you are going to see. You didn't understand scriptures before. Supernatural understanding revelation of scripture is going to come upon your life in Jesus' name. Look at it from verse 22 now. He said, ye men of, of Israel, 
Yemen of Israel. Here, this was Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. And then he said uh, uh, to uh, for me that did by miracles and wonders and signs, which God also did by him in the midst of you all. Then he said, and I see yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him. He began to tell them about this Jesus Christ and he said you took him and then you crucified him and now after he died he was buried and then he rose again because he said his body could not see corruption and then he referred to what David had written. David the king was actually a prophet as well because being a prophet see what he had said and he laid it on them he explained it to them very well and look at verse 29 he says men and brethren let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch david and that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He is seen this before speak of the resurrection of Christ that the soul was not left in the grave, that is in hell, that in hell there means in the grave, and neither did his flesh see corruption. And then he goes on to still talk about the very fact that this Jesus now is risen again. He quoted from the Old Testament. He wasn't only quoting from Joel, he quoted from the Psalms, he quoted from other places, and then he applied thee to them now. You see, that's what the Holy Ghost will do when he comes, when the Holy Ghost comes upon us. You'll be able to preach the Word of God as you approach those sinners and you're talking to them you refer to the psalms you refer to isaiah you refer to this you refer to that it will just be flowing and coming through coming from you and they, they will not be able to escape the conviction of the spirit of god coming upon them because this is what jesus christ had said that when the holy ghost has come look at what he said he will do look at john chapter 14 john chapter 14 i'm reading from verse 26 John chapter 14, verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. That is, when that Holy Ghost comes, you will not be lost for words. You will not say, I don't know what I'm going to tell this sinner now. I want him to be saved. Rescue the perishing. Care for their duty demands sin. Tell him, he, the Lord will save if they will only repent and believe. I know that will happen but what am I going to tell him? You will open your mouth and the Lord will fill your mouth. The Holy Ghost that fills you up, that is dwelling inside you, will speak the word from you through to them in Jesus' name. Because Jesus is that comfort of the Holy Ghost. When he's come, he will teach you all things. What you have to say, he will teach you. He will bring all things to your remembrance. What you shall have spoken unto them. Look at this in John chapter 15 verse 26. It says in John chapter 15 verse 26, but when the comforter, when the comforter is come, because he is coming. I said he's coming, whom I will send unto you from the Father. Even the spirit of truth will proceed from the Father. He shall testify of me. He will op you will open your mouth and the Holy Ghost will give you testimony and the word and the message concerning Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 16. I'm reading there from verse, from verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. I will send him unto you. I, he said, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, because he's coming, when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. And then of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. And then he says of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Then he said, I have many things, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth has come. It will guide you into all truth. Praise the Lord.
I said, praise the Lord. You see, the Pentecostal people, they don't understand. When the Spirit of God has come, He'll guide us into all truth. He'll guide you into doctrine. He'll guide you into teaching. He'll guide you into proper interpretation of the Word of God. He'll guide you into proper understanding of the Word of God. This is what makes us to know that when Jesus Christ promised the Holy Ghost, when He promised us the baptism in the Holy Ghost, it was not just promised on speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues, and they will still feel dry, speaking in tongues, and we're ignorant of the Bible, speaking in tongues, and we don't have light interpretation, understanding of the Bible. He will guide you into all truth. Uh, and whatsoever he tells us, he says, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, for he will show you things to come. I pray this will become a reality in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. And you see, as the Holy Ghost came upon Peter, this is what he began to do. The apostle, he closed the previous quotation with the gracious assurance that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And calling on the name of the Lord there means you are turning away from sin. You are calling upon the Lord. You trust him as your savior. And then he grants us pardon, remission of sin, justification, and salvation. He looks at us as if we have never sinned. He pardons our sin when we call upon him. He saves us when we call upon him. He writes our names in the book of life when we call upon him. And he says, uh, you know, Peter, if I'm said, the one you crucified and the one who died, the Lord, uh, the Lord was raised up. God raised him up from the dead. He spoke confidently and convincingly and he reminded them of the life of Christ. He reminded them of the mission and the ministry of Christ. He reminded them of, of the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ. He even brought into the message of his crucifixion and then his death as well. But then he said, it doesn't stop at death. You know, there are people, they think they are religious. They're still hanging some chain on their neck and uh, they put uh, Jesus there on the cross and say, are you a Christian? Oh, Oh, you as American, look at what I hang on my neck now, and look at uh, you know the cross, and look at Jesus on the cross. He's no more on the cross, it's risen. I said, It's risen. And then he rose, and that's what Peter said. Is if you only stop by the death of Jesus, then the devil would have won because he was killed, he was slain, but because Jesus had the victory. He had dominion over death and hell and the grave. He rose from the dead. And then he ascended up on high. It's not the right hand side of the Father and he's making intercession for us. And then Peter said for you to be convinced that now he's at the right hand of the Father. See what we've got. See what, what, see what we have received. That's why he said in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 32 and verse 33 and that this Jesus has gone God raised up, whereof we are or we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed for this which he now see and hear. Which he now see and hear. He spoke about the ascension of the Lord. He spoke about the glorification of the Lord and the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. See how Peter emphasized that Jesus Christ died for us. His substitutionary death and his supernatural resurrection. All that happened by the damning counsel and foreknowledge of God. And then David being a prophet saw it ahead of time and he said God will raise him up. And in conclusion, he laid it on them so that they will feel the weight of their sin. Look at verse 36. It says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has raised, has made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified. Whom ye have crucified. Whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. It was when they heard that that were pricked in their heart. Now we're going to point number three, a perceived prerequisite before the Pentecostal baptism. That's when they asked the question. Look at verse 37 now. When they heard this, they were preached in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You see, when we have the Holy Ghost, the message we give will stir up something in the hearts of the people. We wake up their conscience. We stir up their guilt. They will want to know what to like. I feel guilty now. I feel condemned now. What you have said is true. We crucified him. What you have said is true. But he rose from the dead. Are we going to be forgiven? Is there any mercy for us? Will God have mercy and compassion on us? Can we be saved? Can 
can all those sins, all those atrocities were committed? Can everything be forgiven and forgotten? That's when Peter now told them, he said, when they said, what shall we do? Look at verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Peter said unto them, repent. What a wonderful thing. You see, there are people that think, you know, when you have the Holy Ghost, you'll be saying things that are away from the Bible. You'll be saying things that you'll not find in the Bible. And when you challenge them, oh, my brother, all this that you are saying, ah, it says, uh, you know, I have the Holy Ghost now. How about Bible? Ah, forget Bible. Forget Bible. Because now we have the Holy Ghost. And because we have the Holy Ghost, we don't speak Bible anymore. We speak something way beyond the Bible. That's evil spirit. I said that is evil spirit. What did Peter say when he said, men and brethren, what shall we do? What did he say? Give me the word. Tell me out loud. Repent. That he gave them the Bible. I'm going to show you now when he told them repent. We're going to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at it from verse 17. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, what will come out of your mouth is scripture. It should not be another word that, you know, way up their false doctrine. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. It's and from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the words of Jesus. When the Holy Ghost comes, he'll put the words of Jesus in your mouth. Let's look at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and verse 15. It tells us in verse 14, Mark chapter 1, now after that, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled. And then it says the kingdom of God is at hand. What's the next word there? Repent ye and believe the gospel. When they asked Peter, what shall we going to do? Peter opened his mouth because he was full of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost brought the scriptures back to his mind. And he brought the words of Jesus to his mouth. Repent. Over here, Jesus said, repent ye and believe the gospel. Look at Luke chapter 13. We read Matthew, we read Mark. We're not going to look at Luke. Luke chapter 13, and I'm reading from verse 3. These are the words of Jesus. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall not likewise perish. Those are the words of Jesus. And so when they asked Peter, and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? He just brought out the words of Jesus. When you are full of the Holy Ghost, when you are saturated with the Holy Ghost, when you are indwelled by the Holy Ghost, when the outpouring of the Holy Ghost is upon your life, it's the words of Jesus that will fill your heart and fill your mouth and fill your language and as look at verse 5 in verse 5 I tell you nay except you repent ye shall all likewise perish look at Luke chapter 24 verse 47 Luke chapter 24 verse 47 and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem repent 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 Everywhere you find that word, it is to repent. I was looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 19. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, we're looking at verse 19. Acts, chapter 3, verse 19, repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 26, unto you, unto you, false God. Have been sent, have been raised up Jesus, his son Jesus, sent him to, uh, to bless you and to in turning away every one of you from his iniquities, repentance. That's what you'll find. The Holy Ghost filled Peter, filled those apostles, and they raised their voice. And then Peter became the mouthpiece for every one of them when the people wondered, wondered what are we good? We want to be saved. We want to be rescued. You have said, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We want to be partakers of that salvation. He said, If you are going to be partakers of that salvation, repent. Do you know there are people today, they say they have the Holy Ghost, they say now this is the new modern way of getting people saved. They say, don't worry about your sin. Don't, God does not worry about any sin. All he wants is just raise up your hand and believe. Just believe. Just believe. What are they believing? What are they believing? Do they believe that they are sinners? 
Do they believe that they cannot save themselves? Do they believe that if they died in their sin, they will go to hell? Do they believe that only Jesus can save? Do they believe that the presence of Jesus will clear away, will break the power, the backbone of sin in their lives? Do they believe that when they come to Christ, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature, all things are passed away, all things have become new? Do they believe that the indwelling Christ will make them victorious over temptation every day of their lives? They just say, believe, believe. But you see, it starts with repentance, with repentance. And I'm ready to you. And the Holy Ghost spoke through Peter and he said, this is what you are going to do. You are going to repent. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. And I'm reading from verse 30. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God went at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He commanded all men everywhere, all men every, every, in every place, all men in every generation, all men everywhere to repent. And that is the message that even Paul, the apostle, when he came, that's what he kept on emphasizing. Look at uh, chapter 20 of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. And I'm reading here from verse 20 and verse 21. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verses 20 and 21. How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house, testify both to the Jew and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God. God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 26 of Acts. Acts chapter 26 verse 20. Acts chapter 26 verse 20. It says in verse 20, but showed forth unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and um, throughout all the coasts of Judea. And then it says, and then to the Gentiles, whether to the Jews or Gentiles, the same thing, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. You see, that, that's the message. In fact, even Jesus Christ, when he had gone to heaven, he was sending the message to, the, uh, to those angels of the churches in Asia Minor. He tells us in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading there from verse 5. It says in verse 5, remember therefore from when ye have fallen and repent. When somebody had known the Lord before, whether you are a pastor or you are a worker or you are a leader or you are just a member of the church but you are backsliding, that you have left your first love and Christ comes to you now, he's going to tell you the same thing. And if any minister, any preacher, any apostle, feel what the Holy Ghost talks to you, he's going to tell you the same thing, what Jesus said because the Holy Ghost will bring the words of Jesus back and then will speak that to you. And as we speak that and you obey, that Spirit of God will cleanse all your sin in Jesus' name. And then a new life will come, a sanctified soul will come and then you are ready for the Holy Ghost that Holy Ghost will come upon your life. And then it says, look at that verse 5 again, remember therefore for whence thou art fallen and repent, repent, repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove the can thy candlestick out of its place except thou tell me repent. That's the commandment of the Lord. That's the request. That's, the, that's what the Lord wants. Look at verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 16. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You see that repent. You know, even Jesus Christ did not stop that. Even after he's gone to heaven, he still kept on sundering the word here on earth. Repent. Look at chapter 3. In chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 3. He says, remember but therefore, how does how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent? Do you see that? That every time the Lord Jesus Christ still emphasized that thing he said, repent. Look at chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasing. Be zealous, therefore, and tell me. Repent. It's all over there in the Bible. From Matthew to Revelation. I read to you from Matthew to Revelation and it's all the time. Repent, repent, repent. And that's what Peter told the people when they said, what are we going to do now? We feel guilty. We crucified the Lord. Our sins crucified the Lord. Our hands crucified the Lord. 
our agreement with the Roman soldiers, crucified the Lord. What shall we do? And he said, repent. We're coming back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 38. It's uh, Peter said unto them, repent and be ye baptized and, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission, for the removal, forgiveness, pardon of your sins. And ye shall, be, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He said, if you will repent, it will set you on the path that what we have received now, you also will receive. In fact, what if you will repent, now, not only that salvation will come, deliverance will come. Not only that healing will come. Not only that enlightenment will come. Not only that knowledge will come. Not only that the joy of the Lord will come. Not only that even the Holy Ghost in all his fullness will come. Not only that the freshness, the abundant life, everything will come unto you. But you start with repentance. And then he told them in verse 39, he said, for the promise is unto you and to your children. The promise is unto you and to your children. Do you know there are some people that tell us, they say that, you know, that one is adult church. You can teach them about salvation. This one is only youth church, children church. How can you be? They, what they need is education. What they need is success. What they need is promotion. Don't talk about salvation there. For you and your children, the promise is unto you and to your children. Other people tell us that, you know, all those uh, children, we cannot be talking about sanctification, sanctification for children. So why, what, what are you talking about uh, for the adult? Adult sanctification, but for these uh, young people, young people will fight. Young people will get angry. Young people will see they are still young people. But it says the promise is unto you, whether it is salvation or sanctification or the Holy Ghost baptism. You know, some people find some parents will say, "What did they teach you in the youth uh, section? What did they teach you in the children's section today?" The, the teacher told us about after we are saved, we need to be sanctified. After we are sanctified, we need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Uh, children, church, Holy Ghost baptism. What, what are they teaching our children? And then when they see our teacher say, what are you telling these children? Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. We well, understand for us adults, but for the children's church, we thought that they are to clap their hands. Jesus loves you. They say, no, for the Bible tells me so. I think that's all that, that you are to tell them. Holy Ghost baptism, the promise is unto you and to your children. Whether it's salvation unto you and to your children. Sanctification for you and for your children. Holy Ghost baptism for you and your children. Heal faith, dynamic faith that's able to move mountains for you and for your children. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature for you and for your children. The totality of the word of God is for you and for your children. This Bible and I, it will be for me. It will be for my wife. It will be for my husband. It will be for my children. I and my children, whom the Lord has given me, were for signs and for wonders in the land in Jesus' name. If you are there, you have your Bible. Where is your Bible there? You and your Bible. You and your Bible. You and your children. You and your father. You and your mother. You and your children. You and your parents. This Bible, you believe it together. Every promise in that Bible, that promise is unto you and to your children. And to them that are far off, as many as they Lord our God shall call. Tonight that promise is yours. Tonight that promise is yours. Father, mother, children, youth, campus, everybody, that promise is yours tonight in Jesus' name. Rise up and claim it. Rise up and claim the promise of God. It is yours. It is yours. It is yours. You are going to have the promise of the power of the Holy Ghost will come upon your life. You will never be the same again. You will never be the same again. Weakness will go away from your life. Timidity will go away from your life. Fear will go away from your life. If there is anything in your life, repent. If you have not told the Lord Jesus Christ as your pastor, Savior, this is the moment where you say, oh Lord, here am I. I turn away from my sin. I turn away from all the evil in my hand. Repent, repent, repent. A new life will come into you. A new life will come into you. If any man be in Christ, a new creature, all things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. It will cleanse you. It will purge you. It will totally purge the floor. And after you are saved, it will sanctify you. It will purge you. It will sanctify you. It will cleanse you from the inner man. All all that Adamic nature, all that stony earth, it will take away and it will give the heart of flesh. And you'll be able to say, praise the Lord, I'm saved. Praise the Lord, I'm sanctified. And then he fills you with the Holy Ghost. Come, Holy Ghost. Come, Holy Ghost. 
come Holy Ghost. Do you feel dry? Invite the Holy Ghost. Do you feel powerless? Invite the Holy Ghost. Do you feel weak? Invite the Holy Ghost. Do you feel timid and fearful? You feel there's no courage, no conviction? Invite the Holy Ghost. Come Holy Ghost. Come Holy Ghost. This is the hour. We need you this very hour. Let him come. Let him come. While they were waiting on the day of Pentecost, was really come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, 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 there was this rushing mighty wind from heaven. And he filled all the house where they were sitting. And then clothing tongues like a fire came upon each of them. Let that fire come that will burn all the chaff in your life. Let that fire come. All the non essentials of your life, all the useless things of your life that will burn all the chaff away and then that zeal of the Lord, that power of the Lord, that strength of the Lord, that vigor of the Lord, that courage coming from the Lord will fill your heart then you'll be able to reach out with the power of the word of God you'll be able to reach out, you will evangelize, you'll be able to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature there'll be vision, there'll be dreams there'll be passion, there'll be zeal there'll be the driving force you'll be going out and preaching the gospel everywhere you go, you'll not allow sinners and allow you to just lie down there and to perish the, 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 the zeal to go rescue the perishing will be there when the Holy Ghost comes upon you you will no more be folding your hand and closing your mouth and acting as if you are not you are not interested in saving souls whether in your community in your Jerusalem in your, in your Judea in Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth the, 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 the vision for mission the vision for mission will be painted in your heart you'll say yes Yes, I'm going. Yes, I'm going. As daddy is going, mommy will follow. As daddy and mommy are going, children are supporting. And children also, they want to do the same thing. They want to take this word of the Lord to all the places of the world. You take the word to your school. You take the word to your college. You take the word everywhere. Because the Holy Ghost has filled you now. You shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses of them, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth, you'll save the vision of the Macedonian call. Come over to Macedonia and help us. We're perishing here. We, we're in darkness here. Come over. Come over. Come over to Macedonia and preach to us and enlighten us and lead us in the way of righteousness. You'll not just be tied down in that local church, in that local place. There's no zeal. There's no passion. There's no vision. There's no excitement. There's no drive. There's no inner drive to go out to witness and to go out and preach to other people and if your husband is going on mission are we going again are we going again because the holy ghost is not there when the holy ghost is there with joy with, ex with excitement praise the lord we're going to macedonia praise the lord we're going to the regions beyond praise the lord we're going to win souls unto the lord let that passion come let that holy ghost come holy ghost come holy ghost come holy ghost come and when he comes you'll never be the same again God will use you in a tremendous way. God will use you in a powerful way to win souls to the Lord in this hour. You are the man of the hour. You are the woman of the hour. You are the family of the hour. The Lord has seen if all the families are there and they have not been called to go and do that, this special privilege has come to you. So that you will take the gospel and take it to the regions beyond. Influence other people. Influence other people. If you stay near somebody who is zealous, you'll be zealous. If you stay near somebody who is wise, you'll be wise. If you stay near somebody who is fiery, you'll be fiery. If you stay near somebody who is a hot and up and being for the Lord, the same thing will splash on you. Influence other people so that they too, they will go to all the corners of the world and preach the gospel to every creature.